New York City is invisible. All cities are, but this one is so fine to look at that we're often fooled into thinking that we see it. We don't see it. Not the real city. For the real city is beyond the sight of any one man. The real city is the sum of all the lives it contains. A sum of lives that's never added up. You take that ferry boat there, Endlessly shuttling back and forth between Manhattan and Staten Island. It's a fragment of my New York. But what about the view of the man who spends his whole working life on that boat? His name is Captain Sweeting. What is there about the water that appeals to some men? I don't know. I believe it's once it, once it gets in your blood, you keep following the water all the time. I, yeah. I've been uh, on the water all my life. Uh, my father ahead of me was a seagull man. My brother was a senior old man, and I followed right in their footsteps. Yeah. Gets in the blood. That's right. When you were when you were a small boy, did you did you know you wanted to be a, a waterman? Uh... Oh yes, I was on the water when I was 13. Yeah. I always managed to be on some sort of a boat, yeah. well, hanging around the docks. Yeah. So I guess that's. <laughs> That's been my whole life around water. Yeah. But it's a funny thing, as soon as I get my vacation, I go up in the mountains. <laughs> it's a great skyline we've got here. Beautiful. You ever get tired of looking at it? No, I like it very much. As a matter of fact, I like it at night when it's all lighted up. Yeah. It looks just like a mountain of gold. It must be a very impressive sight to people that's coming from uh, foreign ports. First thing they, they really look at when they come in here. Huh? That's right. It's a beautiful sight for those people. And I see around here right now, we Jimmy uh, cut the speed down so we don't enter too uh, fast into that slip. Yeah. Now that tide is coming down out of the East River now. Yeah. This is where you have to be on your toes. Supposing you hit the side with a, with a great bonk, are you embarrassed? Uh, yes, it is a little embarrassing. We try not to do it, naturally, but uh, as I say, every once in a while, the tide might be a little bit uh, stronger than what we figure on. See, each trip that you make here, a different tide. The tide is either getting stronger or weaker. Yeah. So every landing that you make is different. Now we're going to nudge the side of it. We're just going to touch it. Yeah. Well. This this looks like pretty pretty uh, pretty good landing. Well, this is our regular normal landing, I guess. You come up against one of the sides and make contact, and then push yourself That's forward. That's right. On the slope out. Yeah. So we don't jar anybody that might be on the staircase and ready to... Uh... Now it's just sliding... Sliding right into place. That's right, on their own. We're pressing forward to pour off. Just as soon as we enter the slip, everybody seems to work out on a bow. They want to see if you make a fair hey, land. The invisible city, the sum of the lives of its people. We can never get the total. When you look at it this way, the idea is nonsense. But every day, whether we want to or not, we gain a little ground, a place we've never noticed 
the words of a man we've never known, every day our exploration takes us forward just a bit. Early in the morning, the foot of Manhattan Island stands silent, a loud silence. The buildings speak of a great potential as they reach lonely toward the sky. Something important is about to happen. First, the streets are empty, and then the emptiness is underlined by a few pedestrians. New York is a great machine, powerful and intricate, beginning to take motion, idling into action, increasing its rhythm. We begin to get a sense of the towering concentration of people. They move quickly, with purpose. Hurry, hurry, get to work, get the day started. No time to dawdle. No time to pause and glance about. No time to look up and wonder. No time to wonder what something outside the customary orbit is like. Have you ever noticed the window cleaning devices they put on the new buildings? The Chase Manhattan has one. It's a platform rigged to rails on the roof. It can be rolled to any part of the building and then lowered quickly, quietly, from a great height to any level. It can give you a wonderful view of the city from 60 stories up. It can give you some bad moments if you don't like heights. The men who run this machine are proud of it. Jim Blue leads the team like the captain of a new and spectacular ship. Far below, tiny automobiles honk and fidget. Little dots that must be people crawl about. Up here, the air is clear. The work has pattern. Jim has style. How long have you been working in this profession? Since 1957. And how did you come to start in the first place? Well, I got tired of traveling around. I thought I'd settle down. So I should settle down. <laughs> well, have you always worked on tall buildings? No. You started low and worked started up? Started low and worked up. Uh-huh. Does, uh, does it ever bother you? Does it spook you to look down when you've got 60 stories underneath you? Well, it did at first for a little while, but not, not anymore. You get used to it, huh? You get used to it after a while. You, you never feel scared? No. Uh -huh. You never feel nervous or worried about the equipment or anything like that? Well, I always make sure it's in good shape before I go out on it. And how, how many, uh, how, how much area can you cover in a day's work with this apparatus? Quite a bit. We, we haven't exactly uh, timed it yet. Yeah. We just keep working. Tell me, do you ever stop working? Let's go at it from that way. I mean, there's the old story about the Brooklyn Bridge, which we can see from here, that they start painting it at one end, and when they finish it, then they go back and start again. Well, that's just what we do here. And it's the same thing here. That's right. Uh -huh. We have so much glass inside to... We'll never get finished. You'll never get finished. <laughs> we just keep going. Have you been working at it long enough to get a cycle worked out? I mean, you know, so you'll know when you'll end up doing this particular window right here again. That's right. Yeah, how long does that take, that cycle? When I finish it, when I go all the way around, yeah. I come back. We figure about a month. About a month to the whole thing. Uh -huh. Tell me, are you married? Yes, sir. You have kids? I have three lovely little boys. Uh -huh. How does your wife feel about this kind of work? She think it's uh, dangerous? Well, yes, but she's Worried never seen me on this building. Oh, she's never seen you here? No. Is she afraid to come and watch you? Well, no, I don't think so. You, you ever figured to invite her around? And, uh, oh, yes. Uh-huh. You, you don't think she's going to be a little bit scared? Maybe? Well, she might. <laughs> <laughs> but she doesn't, uh, she doesn't worry over much about you? No, Certainly not still. too much. What about the kids? Well, they don't really know. The two of them are too small to understand. And the big boy, he's seen me working, so he thinks it's something. Jim Blue lives on Pitt Street in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. It's a mixed neighborhood. Some of the buildings are pretty run down. Some have been fixed up. Mrs. Blue's kitchen is neat, if a bit crowded. And the rest of the apartment is somewhat small to hold a big boy 
a small boy, a guitar, and a baby. I think he's getting sleepy, by the way. Yes, he is. He's getting very tired. Now, what's he going to do? He likes to eat paper, like all babies. He seems pretty curious about what uh, what goes on around him. Yes, he's very. Has, does he have, has he ever gone on a real paper jag and put away quite a lot of it? He eats the TV every week. Oh, a fan <laughs> doesn't uh, make him sick to eat. <laughs> well, we get it before he swallows it. Oh, I see. He just chews it, huh? Yes. Yeah. Strange habit. Now, what's he going to do with it? He's fascinated. Yeah, he's very really fascinated. See what I mean? Yeah, there you go. But you, all babies usually do that, though. They do. Well, yeah. Especially when they're teething, they yeah. put everything. Oh, it like to, he likes having something to sort of chomp on, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. he's got a problem. Let's try him on the milk again. Okay. I think we ought to try him on bed. What do you think? Yes, I think he can take a little nap. Now. Okay, why don't you tuck him in and see what happens? Uh, one, two, three. How long have you lived here, in this place? In this, well, I, uh, well, my mother lived here before we did. In the same building? Yes, right here in the same oh, apartment. Oh, the same apartment, I see. And you yes. took, you took the, the yes. apartment over from her. Uh -huh. Yes. When was that? Oh, it's about 10 years. Oh, you've been here a good while now. And, and where did you live before that? In, in, also in New York? Oh, yes. Uh -huh. Just around the neighborhood. In the same neighborhood? Yes. Do you feel attached to this area? I mean, you wouldn't want to live anywhere else? No, I'd be lost without it. What do you and your husband uh, like to do? What's your favorite uh, fun when you're finished with the day's jobs? And I, well, we like to sit and watch television. You're really fond of it, huh? Yes, very much. That makes you a couple of homebodies. I mean, do you, ever, do you go out much? Not very much, what do no. you What do you do when you do go out? I don't know. We haven't been out so long. I, really? I can't remember what we uh -huh. did. What are your What are your friends like? Most of them. Do you have any type of friends that you? Well, we haven't got very many friends. Mm -hmm. Most of the family come once in a while. Yeah, that's you, about all. Do you have people in every day? Oh, maybe once in a while we'll have a card game, something mm -hmm. like that. But otherwise, I don't know. We've always got something to do with the kids. <laughs> well, you got three of them. That's yeah. That's quite a lot. That's enough. Three fine boys. A home and a neighborhood the family loves. Across the street is a city park with a swimming pool and play areas for children. Not much room for grass. Nothing like the room in the greatest park of them all, Central Park, in the middle of Manhattan. A true park must be big. It must have scope, variety, room for solitude. It must contain the means to lose the world and everything else in concentration on one single thing. Like the fish that are out there trifling with one's bait. A park must contain the substance of discovery Central Park has mounted police to survey its rambling paths. It has ladies with binoculars to survey the activities of birds. It has room and subject for painters. And room for a population of sophisticated squirrels. Central Park has an endless supply of kids. The children are wonderful to watch. All life is a marvel for them. A tumble of swings, a babble of cool water. For them, 
Life is a song of balloons that reach mysteriously for the sky. It is a clutter of contemplative animals in cages. This is their city. A city holding tall ships that slash through green water, that unleash a cannonade, that race in a great regatta, all within reach on a summer's day. And their parents put to sea as well. Always room for one more. Another fleet where that came from. Another weighty shipload. In fact, Central Park has something for everyone, and each person who comes here acquires his own private piece of the city. There's no effort required. In fact, it may be that the best use of a park is its function as a place to take it easy, to regroup one's forces, to snooze, to dream to smooth things out, to take the long view of things. It's a place to stretch one's legs and learn how to climb into the sun. Across the street from Central Park on the west side, there stands a building dedicated to learning, a building that is eerie, dowdy, and lovable, the Museum of Natural History. Anyone who has grown up in New York will volunteer the love. So will anyone who has trooped through in long straggles of school children, or who has creaked after a really energetic seven-year-old. But the eerie quality is there as well, to tease us into learning. Perhaps it's the very paradox of inanimate life that makes the museum work. For here stands an elaborate testament to man's consuming interest in the living world. And yet there's nothing living to be seen, except spectators. If the people who build and maintain the exhibits need bracing, all they have to do is nip out from behind the scenes and look at the faces of children. Here is the canny wonder that makes science. These children are studying a case showing the stages of human birth. They show a guarded astonishment, as do we all. And everywhere springs up that urge to touch, to try, to find out. And behind the cases, unseen by visitors, a very living and active corps of experts keeping the museum a growing place. Dr. Richard Van Gelder is an expert on mammals and head of that department. What is his particular line? Uh, right now, I'm specifically interested in skunks, and I have been for the last 12 years. How does a man get specifically interested in skunks? Just lucky, I guess. Uh -huh. uh, uh, it, was, it was a field that nobody had had anything to do with yeah. for a long time. In other words, uh, a person in, in your line of work will look around for an area that needs a bit of digging, and, uh, and that will be an attraction in itself. That's right. Done uh, that. The fact that no one has worked on uh, some aspect of oh, a life history or a classification or an evolution yeah. uh, makes it uh, good grounds for going in and digging and see what, to see what you can find out. Do you uh, like skunks, having worked on them this period of time? Oh, yeah. I can oh. take them or leave them. Oh, I see. Uh, you, don't have any you don't have any personal <laughs> fondness for them. No. Do you, have you made a pet of a skunk? I've or? had pet skunks. Yeah. Uh, yes, I have one live one now that I'm, uh, I'm expecting to have a litter from very shortly. and. I want to get some information on how fast the young grow. Yeah, is it true they make good pets? I wouldn't recommend them. I think most people who want skunks as pets really want an animal that behaves like a dog but looks like a skunk. What do you do uh, for kicks? What do you do to when you're when you're not being uh, um, a zoologist? What do you? Uh... 
Well, I don't know. I don't have any hobbies. I take uh, pictures, but that's in connection with my work generally. And uh, I've been working on some popular books, but those are on animals too. Yeah. Uh, I guess I just work at this pretty much of the time. So it goes on, the aiding and abetting of human curiosity. And outside the Museum of Natural History, high on a stately horse, sits the spiritual father of the place, President Teddy Roosevelt, rough rider and explorer. He always seems to have a guest. And that's another institution likely to stay with us. There are various attitudes you can take toward lunch in New York. Lunch can be snatched standing or stretched sitting down. Utilitarian or artistic. I prefer the hit and run method on the street. Or when I want to get solidity without losing the pace of the explorer, I like to grab lunch at a delicatessen like Katz's in Houston Street. Delicatessens have their artists. Delicatessens abound in substance. They are places for practical people who like to live vehemently, but who fancy a touch of philosophy as well. Like Saul Auerbach, a semi-retired waiter who enjoys conversation and productive thought. How long have you lived here? Since I came from Russia. You came from Russia? Oh, yeah, I come from Russia in 1913. Yeah. And I'm a citizen. I live all my life in New York State. You think it's a cosmopolitan place? It is. It is. It is. You make friends very easy. You make neighbors very easy. You move in, in a section where you are not known, or you never visited them. It is a pleasure. Yeah. What do you do for uh, recreation when you're not working? What do you do to pass the time? Well, when I'm home, I'm a subscriber to Reader's Digest. I have a monthly subscription and also three months, the books. Then I'm a subscriber to Life magazines, watch television. So would you say that you're a happy man? You've got uh, your life to look back on now and you're partially retired. Would you say you're a happy man? Well, I'll tell you, if I would have sufficient to retire entirely, I would be much happier. Yeah, well, do you think you've had a happy life? I had, I had. I married two daughters, had two nice grandsons, I mean, grand... Uh, grandchildren. Grandchildren. And uh, one has a home, a car, and they come down to see me. And I remind myself the days when I struggled and fought in order to give them the education. I'm happy. What do you think the secret of happiness is? If, if I were to come to you and say, ask your advice on this, what's the secret? The secret is when you're not hungry, when you're not sick. Never had a duck. Did you hear the knock? Never had a duck. Only the doctors that we had is to deliver the grandchildren. Don't you think you need something more in your life besides uh, uh, just not being sick and just not being hungry? What do you, what do you need that's positive? Insurance. <laughs> Lunch is a time to level off. To review one's attitudes open-mindedly. Because after lunch, New York changes gear, slows down here and there, stretches and sighs. The light mellows a little. Old buildings take on a more venerable glow. 
There are so many beautiful places to live in New York. Some there for anyone to see, but some are half hidden. Gramercy Park is one of the retiring ones. Fine old houses. A park that is reserved for local residents. A leisurely, diffident place. Turtle Bay, between 2nd and 3rd Avenues in mid Manhattan, is just about totally hidden. From the street, an ordinary block with some nice houses. But inside the block, a garden which alters everything. Once you're in this garden, New York becomes a different city. Rush and clatter die away. Time slows down. It's been this way for nearly 40 years. And nice houses have become beautiful houses. Mr. William Platt is a Manhattan architect who walks to work and likes it. Mr. Platt, are you a wealthy man? Uh, I shouldn't say so. You shouldn't uh, say so. Uh, Modest? Uh, well, comfortably well off. Comfortably well off, but you're not, uh, you're not a, what, what would be under ordinary New York circumstances called a wealthy man. Uh, the reason I ask the question is, uh, is obvious. This is a very beautiful home and a very uh, central location, and uh, uh, it's a home that would be very hard for one to, to get these things. Well, I, I think if you tried to buy it now, if you tried to establish yourself in a house like this, and with prices as they are now, it would be a, you'd have to be in the dough, as the, mm -hmm. as the saying goes. Yeah. Now, you've lived here for, for quite a while, haven't you? Yes, I, uh, I, I met my wife in this, not met her, but... Uh, we were engaged in this house, and it uh, seemed a good thing to stay on here. <laughs> and have you gotten, you, you, do you feel, uh, you must feel very tied to this place. It must seem like a home in the, in the really grand sense. Well, I do. I, uh, before I was, uh, before I came to live here, I, li uh, I lived in a house on 64th Street, and I lived in an apartment on 66th Street. Where were you uh, born? I was born in New York City. Yes. But both of those were uh, very attractive. Uh, the house was attractive and the apartment was a unique one. Yeah. And, uh, but still I found uh, this house and this area uh, perfect as far as myself and my family. You've never felt that you um, wanted to move somewhere else? You mean out of town? Out of town, yes. Uh, no. Yes. My, I, I have a brother that commutes and Friends that commute, but I've always felt that uh, if you're going to work in New York, you ought to live here. The garden at Turtle Bay is central to the lives of its residents. It seems as if it's been there a long time and will last. There is a common walk which runs the length of the block with gates opening into individual garden areas. It's a neighborly place, a quiet place, where one can stroll and talk with friends or withdraw a few feet into leafy privacy. Mrs. Platt spends a good deal of time in her garden. Do you find that the, uh, the place is getting noisier? It, you are, after all, practically in the shadow of, uh, of the Chrysler building. You're right in the center of things here. Do you find well, that it's noisier? I think it was a very different noise when we were first here. We heard ever so much more of the elevateds and the streetcars, which were racket makers, you now know. You had, you, had, where did, you had elevators on 3rd Avenue and on 2nd Avenue on as second, well? On 2nd, both. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, stations near us on both. So that the slamming of doors and the squeaking of brakes went on all the time. Uh, 
and we used to have a hard time talking to people even then really? out in the yard once in a while i think this is something pretty novel to find a neighborhood in new york that's quieter now than it was in 1925 say well i would say that our street outside is much noisier than it was then my brothers could lie under the car mending it in those days and there would be perhaps just one car parked on the street and the boys played ball on the street which they can't possibly do now uh did you you had you brought up children here did you? Uh, we brought up our three children here yes. did you uh worry about your kids when they were growing up in manhattan did you worry about their coming to harm or their no uh, I didn't. And as a matter of fact, I think that uh, they had a freedom that the children of very rich people did not have because it, some of them grew up in the days of the kidnappings mm -hmm. and the scares. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would envy our children who went around alone and did yeah. what they wanted. Did they have the free run of this whole neighborhood reaching out into... Uh... Well, they yes, they did. Mm -hmm. uh, especially the boy who wanted it more. I think the girls liked uh, their friends in the yeah. garden and doing mm -hmm. things here. And uh, he and his young friends, as soon as they got to the age when they were allowed to cross streets alone, began branching out. And I made some very fascinating discoveries while they were doing that. Like what? Well, like the day that it poured rain and uh, we were on Park Avenue and not suited to come home or go anywhere in the rain and right near the entrance of the Waldorf. And my boy, who was quite little then, seven or eight, said, uh, why don't we go through the Waldorf? And I said, no. You don't walk through people's places unless you have business or, or, or some reason for being there. Uh, but it was raining so hard that I gave in, and I noticed the doorman tipped his hat to my son, not to me. We walked through and came out on the Lexington Avenue side, and there the doorman knew my son. And by a little questioning, I found out that it was his habit, whenever he went anywhere, to walk through the Waldorf, <laughs> and that the doorman thought he lived there. What is your basic feeling about New York City? You've lived here a good part of your life. Do you, do you have the feeling the city's going to the dogs? Do you? No, I That's... think it's a very interesting place. Uh -huh. You well, still feel cheerful about it? Yes, I do. And I think that any place that has to be a melting pot for as many different, well, either citizens or non-citizens mm -hmm. arriving and mm -hmm. settling or drifting through it is bound to have a complicated and difficult time. You know how rough it used to be way back at the beginning of the last century and the early 19th century there were lots of delinquency a, lots, lots of violence of delinquency lots of... and terrible uh -huh. rough fights on the street and so on yeah i suppose it's just, there's a great deal more sp uh, spread around now in larger areas because it's such so much bigger a place yeah i would like to see it better and mm -hmm. i would like to see the young well looked after in this city you think there could be more parks and that sort of thing well yes and then more people concerned with them The children in Turtle Bay have a great time of it. They have a safe place to grow up, and there are always lots of young people about. Young Julie Tandler lives next door to the Platts. You like living in Manhattan itself? Yes, I adore Manhattan. Where else have you lived? Well, I've, I've lived here all my life, but I've lived in Europe also. You've lived in Europe? Uh-huh. Where in Europe? Vienna. Yeah, no. Mostly. My, my parents are from Vienna. So. Yes. Where else? Um, well, mostly in Europe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in New York. But you, uh, does New York have your heart? I mean, is this the place you like Definitely. to be? Definitely. Why is that? Oh, it's so cosmopolitan. You can, you can be alone while being with millions of people. Mm-hmm. People from all over, you mean? People from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And Austria, Europe, I mean, Vienna only has Italians and Germans and French to mm -hmm. the greatest degree. Of course, they have others, but yeah. it's mostly that. Mm -hmm. And so it's more of a sort of smaller in a sense. I see. New York seems cosmopolitan on a larger scale. Yes. Well. Do you like New York better? Oh, yes. I feel sort of, I feel smaller in New York mm -hmm. because it's so great and in Vienna I feel larger. <laughs> so I like to contrast the two. Do you think New York's more of an exciting place than Vienna? Well, New York is, is a humming place and Vienna is more of an easy place for, to relax in and to, to enjoy. You have to enjoy Vienna. In New York you have to work. 
You have to feel busy because everybody else is busy. Even when you're playing? Yep. Because you're busy in a busy way. <laughs> At mid-afternoon on Fifth Avenue, American woman comes into her own at speed. She's out on the endless project of making herself more beautiful than ever. With an appetite for broken field running that bewilders the average male. Observe the nimble female feet. For beauty is worth pursuing, and New York women pursue it. Into places like Bergdorf Goodman, for example, where both prices and style cut a high, graceful arc. where a lady can keep an other self upstairs waiting to be fitted and stitched into glory. Anne Folatico is a seamstress at Bergdorf. Do you enjoy making beautiful things? Oh, I most certainly do. Yes, a sense of creation? That's right. How long have you been working with this? 28 years. Mm -hmm. And how did you get into it in the first place? What was your... Well, I went to a trade school first, and then uh, came here. Didn't think I'd be here this long, but here I am, in 28 way. years. <laughs> and you still like it? Oh, very much. Mm -hmm. It's uh, a sense of satisfaction to see beautiful things, and uh, what you could do with nice materials. Do you make uh, gowns for yourself? Occasionally, but after a day's work, you're not too anxious to go home and do the same thing again. Do you ever get a sort of a Cinderella complex? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I, feel, uh, I feel if I really wanted them, I could make them for myself, uh, so... Uh, Why well, feel that way? Where do you live? In the village. Oh, you like it, don't you? Very much. I was born there and lived there since. Born in the village and lived there? That's right. Uh, so you're a real villager, then? I'm a real... Old-fashioned home-type villager. What is an old-fashioned home-type villager <laughs> well, as opposed to the... That's ordinary life. You go get up, go to business, come back, do your shopping. We have all sorts of stores in the village where you can go along and pick up practically anything. And you go home, have your dinner, and then maybe go out to a movie, just like everybody else does. That's why I say we're the old-fashioned type. It's the same at Macy's. The lady has things very much her own way. The New York women in action, on the hunt, are splendid to watch. They know what they want, and they greatly enjoy the chase. At Klein's, the texture deepens. Movements are swifter, more competitive. But nothing deters the huntress when she is in full cry. Males of all ages are well advised to step aside. For she's looking for that triumph, that amazing, appropriate bargain, which is the token of the game. Up and down the avenue they go, sturdy and indefatigable. To the south, at the very foot of Fifth Avenue, there stands a refuge. Washington Square is a very good place to pause, to look at the sky, to readjust the temple. And the square always contains New Yorkers who enforce their own concept of what counts. Leisure counts. Thought counts. Repose counts. Determined action counts. Freedom of action 
counts. And art. Art most particularly counts. The transactions of creating and looking seem just right for Washington Square. Where else would you meet a young lady with an eye in the middle of her forehead? Where else would you find such range and variety of vision? Vision like that of Sam Gates. How long have you been showing paintings, sir? I'm showing paintings for the last 14 years. What do you think of this as a place to exhibit? This is the finest. Why do you say the that? The finest because uh, it's for the masses, not for the uh, just the exclusive people, I mean. Mm -hmm. Like the uh, rich or whatever you want to call it. It's for the plain people coming down and having a lot of fun. It's like a carnival. At the same time, seeing wonderful paintings, nice paintings. Do you see a lot of people here on the, during the week? Not many, but no. just friends come around. Yeah. How is it as a place to sell paintings? Well, I'm not interested in selling. I don't paint for selling. To me, the most important thing is expression. I feel good and, I, and I'm happy of doing it. I love it so much. Because uh, that means so that I went to different academies and, and I was taught not to go for money. And anyone that paints for money cannot be a great artist. He's got to feel it. In other words, he almost got to have a, uh, a crying heart. In fact, at the same time, I, as I made some translations of, of Edgar Allan Poe's works, like Anna Lee. You translated them? Yes, I did. Into what? Into uh, Yiddish. Yiddish, uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, is that difficult? That's, what, that's my love, is either poetry or painting and uh -huh. music, of course. Was it difficult to translate Poe into Yiddish? Well, it was, but I made, I did a good job. That's what I was told, mm -hmm. because I feel it. That's me, you see. I, uh, I was never a, uh, I was never a baby. I was never a kid. My mother used to call me uh, the old soul. I was never, a, I was never a young boy. Always old. <laughs> you were born old. Huh? I was born an old man. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, when you're, when you're showing here, do you wander around and talk to other artists and so on? Well, I usually am a very peaceful man, very quiet, and, uh, and then again, uh, I have a certain fear in me. I, I know that uh, the artist comes out here, he has an obligation. He is responsible for what he's shown to the people. Some people are on here I hate to criticize. They don't care what they come out with, but I will not do it. It took me a long, long time before I felt that Oh, you deserve. I'm worthy to call myself a well a half artist, not a full-fledged artist. I'm not. Some people they admire my work, but inside I'm not so happy. Why I'm not happy? Because I still didn't do, didn't do the job what I'm supposed to do. Because when I look at a Kube or a Kuro, I know when I look at mine, I says, "You gotta work, and hey, you gotta work a lot in a long time." Of course, time is running out on me. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen. When time runs out on the New York working day, the rhythm of the city changes again. Elevators rush up to load and poke down full. The exodus begins. Down and out toward home or toward the evening's entertainment. But there's not the same frenzy as in the morning. The step is more solid, more fulfilled. The weight comes down on the heel. There is bustle enough and energy enough there but it's one notch down, held in reserve for the more private side of life. This mood spreads, communicates itself to the traffic. So another version of the city is created where the evening is full of high potential, 
Who knows what it may not contain? And behind the cabs rolling up all over town, another life is beginning. At places like the Waldorf, where waiters are girding themselves for action. Lined up like troops before a tough sergeant in the person of head waiter Arthur Hagedorn, they get a pep talk that sounds like an order of battle. Now, of course, when you come here, leave your problems in the locker room when you check in there. Because everybody has it, not only you. Everybody thinks he's the only one has Everybody has problems. When I look around, I can, uh, one to one, there's 150 problems, I can tell you. One of everyone has it. Everybody has some. Don't bring them all to me at one time. Bring them to me by and by, and I listen to you. But while you're here in business, please forget your problems at home. Because you only can better your problem at home when you are at the job and bring home the bacon. I know that some of you fellas had your dinners while I called you out. Now, before you're going back and finish your dinner, I want you to look over your station once more, your table, put your menus on, and light up. Okay, fellas? Now the night is underway, and Broadway comes into its own. Carnival. Jim Crack. Gay. Sometimes sad. Lots of things to do, lots of things to stop and watch. Movement, a flow that seems likely to go on forever. Something for everybody. And always the wistful question, what are they thinking of? They may be wondering the same about you. The great migration to the theaters. Laughter, gossip, glamour, tinsel, stars and big cars. Stars on glittering signs. Stars in people's eyes. And people, people, people. An endless supply of people. Flowing like light. And presiding over it all, contemplative, the newspaper seller Edward Duffy. How long have you been working on the night side? Oh, a good many years. Sir. How long? Oh, 30, 35 years. Yeah, you like the night work? Well, I think it's pretty good. Uh -huh. We have a good night life here. Yeah. What, what is there about night work that you like? Well, the cool breezes. Yeah. And the people hurrying to and fro there and the, and the nice scenery around here. Uh -huh. I like that very much. Do you think the, the atmosphere at night's a lot different from the day, huh? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. A great deal of difference. See different sort of people? Oh, yes. People are different, too. How are they different? They're more conciliatory. At night? They're not quite in such a rush. Uh-huh. Do you yeah. get time to have a chat with some of your customers? Well, not a, exactly a chat, a, a kind word here and there. Yeah. And it's a little different from days when they were anxious to get home or come to work. Or something. Yeah. Something like that's vastly different. Yeah. Yes, indeed. How long have you lived in New York? Oh, 45 years. 45 years. You like it as a place? Well, I wouldn't be here if I didn't. <laughs> I can assure you I'd have moved someplace I do like. Yeah. What's good about New York? Oh, it's the greatest good city in the world. What, what, is it, what is it that you like? That, about oh, tall buildings, yeah. sweeping vistas and everything, Central Park, Statue of Liberty, Empire State Building, tallest buildings in the world. Yeah. Everything is wonderful here. We. You, We've got it on the rest of the world. Do you like the pace? Oh, yes. Yeah. The faster, the better. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's what I like. Yeah. The hurrying and the scurrying. 
to and fro. How do you think that New Yorkers differ from other people? Well, uh, I don't say they differ. Yeah. But I, uh, if you scratch the surface, you'll find they're kind and generous. Yeah. They're merely good workers, and they like to have a good high standard of living, and they like very much to, to go about their business in a, in a fast manner. Yeah. They like that very much. Where do you live? I live right down below here on 33rd Street. In Manhattan? In Manhattan. Yeah. You live there all the time in Manhattan? Oh, yes. I'm a Manhattanite. <laughs> yes, indeed. Do you have a family? Why, no. No, no, sir, I don't. Uh -huh. Do you feel, uh, do you ever feel lonely? Why, why should I feel lonely? I'm surrounded by millions. Why, all around me, millions of people. Why should I feel lonely? Yeah. Why, I, I'm living off the fat of the land, you might say. Yeah. yeah. We have the finest food in the world here, the finest restaurants, theaters, movies, everything is the finest here. Yeah. Why should I feel lonely in the midst of all this splendor? You like the, putting the city to bed after when everything quiets down? You like well, it does now. Years ago, of course, it never went to bed. It was an all-night town, but of course now they kind of sort of go to bed. Why do you think that's happened? Well, uh, I guess a lot of people from farms and go to bed at 9 o'clock, people moved in on us. Huh? I imagine that's the reason. Yeah. But uh, since they've taken all the elevators down, why, uh, it's kind of kind of a little dead at night time, not, yeah. not the all night time at which was. Certainly. Well, I guess I'll just take a couple of papers and say good night to you then. Well, sir. that's fine and then. Okay. Thanks the to you. Thanks to you. Nothing but the best. All this splendor. The city that never stops shining bright in our vision. And yet, invisible to the end.